Hey, come check out a live taping of the John Kime Report. It's going to take place on Monday, November 18th at City Tap in Loudoun 1 out in Ashburn, Virginia. Start time around 8 o'clock. It'll end at 9 p.m. In the show notes, you can find the Eventbrite invitation that you can RSVP to to ensure that you get seats. It's free to show up. And if you can't find the invitation in the show notes, shoot me an email and I'll send you a link directly to you for you to sign up. You can find me at Bram, B-R-A-M, at AmpireMedia.com, A M. P-I-R-E media.com. Bram at EmpireMedia.com. And we look forward to seeing you on the 18th at City Tap Loudon. Empire. Hello and welcome to my podcast. On this episode, I talk with Paul Troth, who played quarterback in college, scouted the NFC East, the quarterback coach for Elite 11, and he's also an analyst for NBC Sports Washington. There's a lot to break down with Dwayne Haskins, and Paul does that exceptionally well. I really enjoyed that conversation, and I think you'll learn a thing or two. And then Mike Jones from USA Today and I discussed the Trent Williams situation, spending time on what we think happens in the future. But first, my conversation with Paul Troth. Now I'm joined by Paul Troth. If you remember, I had him on with me in training camp because of his quarterback insight. He is an elite 11 coach. He's the one, he's the only elite 11 coach in the mid-Atlantic region. He's an NBC Sports Washington analyst. He has done in the past some scouting in the NFC East. He's a former college quarterback. He knows his stuff here, folks, and that's why I wanted to bring him in to talk about, of course, Dwayne Haskins. Um, first, Paul, thanks for joining me. I'm curious what you saw from Dwayne against Buffalo that you say, hey, the Redskins can now build on this? I think the easiest thing that to the, to the average fan's eye was that there was no chaos. Uh, I think that for the most part, going back to preseason, there was a lot of chaos coming in and out of the huddle. There was a lot of uh, big play and then a dud play, whether it was, you know, Get, not getting the playoff in time on the play clock. And I think that had a lot to do with Jay and his play calling. Um, you know, he was trying to dial it up exactly, you know, exactly how he wanted it. And then he's used to having veteran quarterbacks fix him, so to speak. And now I think uh, the coaching staff understands having a rookie in there. They need to be short with the play calls. They need to be specific to the, the game plan that they put in place for Dwayne. And then Dwayne is able to just – call the play and, and run the play. And that sounds simple enough, but um, that's probably 50% of the battle because getting up to the line and, and going through your checks and making sure everybody's set, um, that is kind of a lost art form, uh, especially coming for, for kids in college. I, I, th- I don't think they, they are used to that because everybody's playing from the shotgun and every signal, everybody has their own signaler on the sideline and nobody has to get you know, communication from the quarterback. And that's just been tremendous growth in the short term that I've seen from Dwayne. Um, and I know that that's something that, you know, it sounds simple for folks. I, I know us old heads, you know, that's how we grew up playing football. But this new generation of quarterbacks are not used to that. And the, the kids that can come in the league and be able to verbalize and, and get things out, um, they're going to be, you know, ahead of the game. And they're going to put their thinking to the side and be able to to play to their strengths and then on the field I think Dwayne just you know he didn't do anything splashy but he didn't do anything that you know hurt the team I think that's all you can ask for in the situation that it is right now with the Washington Redskins I think um you know he he if you'd have told me you know if you'd have dropped me on this planet from an outer outer space and told me you know, take a look at Case Keenum playing quarterback and t- take a look at Dwayne Haskins playing quarterback. Th- there was not much difference in my opinion um, because the way the plays are being called and the way the game is being managed, it's very obvious that the Redskins are trying to just grind out and um, play minimal football at this this point. 
did you see a difference in him just in terms of the the way he held himself on the field compared to the first two times he played? Yeah, I think um, pre-snap there was, you know, purpose in his execution. You know, obviously can only get so much from the audio on, on the TV broadcast, sure. but um, in and out of the huddle, you know, immediately making mic calls, immediately getting guys shifted and motioned. Um, but I think demeanor wise, you know, there's times when he, you know, he took some plays for a loss or a sack. Um, and immediately it was just, you know, kind of jog off the field and, and go get the tablet and go, go back to work. There, there was, you know, I think some folks may have noticed in the preseason, you know, it just seemed like every event that happened was amplified by either, you know, his body demeanor or his reaction. Right. You know, I'm not saying that it was good or bad. It just seemed like everything was under the microscope. And, yes. you know, it's kind of it's kind of interesting to see how you go to Buffalo, New York, and you're there's no microscope other than the us folks here in, in D.C. And uh, I think it's good for him. And I think having this bye week is good for him. I think in hindsight, it, it may work out for the best. I, I, I talk with him through text and he just seems in, in a good spot. He's, he's a very confident young man and he's not cocky, but he just, he just wants to, he just wants to play well. He wants to, he wants to be the quarterback. He wants to do what he knows that he's capable of doing. So from what I saw, you know, and even so hearing his teammates afterwards, that's kind of what validated it for me. Um, Cause they weren't, they weren't glowing praises, but they weren't, um, they weren't just player speak, you know, they were, they were honest and you, and you could tell, I mean, you, you know, at this point in that locker room, everybody understands the situation and what's best for the Washington Redskins is playing Dwayne Haskins the remainder of the season. And, and that, you know, it's funny that you say that because I did talk to some people in the locker room afterward and the, the comment was like, whereas maybe they feel like one of these other quarterbacks and, and honestly, I think more, more of them, I think would choose Colt McCoy if you had to say, who do you want to help you win a game right now? But right. Like said, even people who would choose him would say that you're one and eight or they, they, their comment would be, we're one and eight. Of course, we understand why this kid is going to play. He is a 15th overall yeah. pick. And it's not like you right. showed something in that game where you say, oh, this was a disaster. That wasn't the case at all. Right. Could you tell, like, because the one thing that, that, that I've seen from him, too, is, you know, he's every, he, he just turned, as some people there reminded me, he, he had just turned 22. He is a young quarterback. Yeah. And there were times where you felt like maybe the weight of the situation or wh how the situation was maybe got to him a little bit. Could you send, I, and it just from, in, I know you're not around him, that much but could you did you sense that and could you see things even when he played that would suggest that he's not the Dwayne Haskins I know uh were you are you talking about just last week or all season no overall because like last week I felt like there was a change for him in the previous times whether it's Minnesota yeah. or especially the Giants um you know or even if you saw pictures of him on the sidelines and you know yeah things like yeah that. yeah yeah yeah, I had talked with some folks about that. It seemed like he was kind of in, in purgatory a little bit. He was kind of, you know, he he was being a little bit, in my opinion, immature with how he was presenting himself during a game, right? Like, right. Uh, but on the, on the flip side, I think he's the type of person who he's not going to there, – there's, there's leverage in all situations, you know. And when Jay was around and – you know, he's pretty, Dwayne's pretty smart kid. He understands the situation. He, he didn't, you know, you know, stay right beside Jay Gruden and right beside Kevin O'Connell. Now that's probably what, where I would have been, but right. that's not Dwayne Haskins. And that's not, you know, to, to, you know, all accounts, that's not a lot of elite quarterbacks that they, they, they honestly think mindset wise that they should be the guy. So it's it's a it's a double edged sword. If you think you're the guy, if you always think you're the guy, then you're not going to be one to, you know, cowtail to the powers that be that you know for a fact they're probably not going to be there a year from now. So right. do I think that he handled the situation, you know, all that well professionally? I don't 
I don't I, I don't think so, but I also don't think that he ruined his um I don't think he put himself in a bad situation moving forward now that he there's a new coaching staff or interim coaching staff and everybody's kind of understanding that that he's supposed to be the guy. You know, everybody at the station that, you know, even our bosses were like, you know, why why has he got his head down? Why has he got his hat backwards? Why you know, that was after the Minnesota game. And right. um you saw a different presence about him at the end of this past game with Absolutely. Buffalo. And, you know, that's a growing that's a growing thing. And I think the biggest thing that I want from my quarterbacks and, and I don't care one way or the other, you know, times change, that's totally fine. But consistency is key. You know, whoever you are, be that person, whether it's 50-point loss or 50-point win. And I think the real Dwayne was, I would like to say, we saw that after the Buffalo game. The young, immature Dwayne probably was evident after New York and after Minnesota. Um, But sometimes you got to have bad things happen to you for you to learn a lesson and you know, I know for a fact veterans were talking with him before those those games in New York and Minnesota and telling him to be prepared. And, you know, I think he was probably more disgusted with himself. Um, but all that to say, this has been a, probably the, the hardest thing he's ever gone through. And right. I think it'll be good for him. Um, it's just a matter of how long the leash is going to get, you know, at the end of this season um, headed into 2020. And it's funny you say that because I agree. Like, and I I pointed that out as well that he has never faced this kind of adversity as a quarterback. Now he sat for two years at Ohio State, but you're sitting behind a guy in JT Barrett who was not as talented a passer, but was a really good. But had the locker room. Yeah, but yeah, yeah, and had the locker room. Yeah, absolute dominant presence in the locker room and a beloved leader by the coaching staff. So you can understand that one night. But he's even when he when he played there. Even in games where you say that maybe there was some – you can work on this, this, and this, he's still playing. He's still putting up good numbers. So And they're still mm-hmm. winning. So now it's right. like, you know, I, so this is the first time. So that's why I always say, okay, my big thing with the quarterback is how do you respond? Do you, do you respond right. by sulking? Do you respond by working more? Do you respond by bringing more film home, which I know they wanted him to do earlier in the year? So now I think we'll right. get – but I think that's all good because it could build the – don't you think it could build a stronger base to who he is as a quarterback? Yeah, and I think for the most important aspect is from day one next year, it's very obvious who the quarterback will be, right? I mean, it, 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 if something dr- drastic changes, I don't know what that would be unless, you know, obviously ownership goes in and dis- decides differently about the draft and tries to go reach for another one. But the, the way I see it, the way – you know, this is an 18-month evaluation, and, you know, the things that you, – you never screw yourself up so bad at the beginning that you can't recover, and, and I think he recovered quicker than, you know, I think most people thought. I think a lot of people, you know, they were pigeonholing that Buffalo game as that's the game that we would not want him to start because of the right. weather and the defense and the lack of weapons. But, you know, Dwayne Haskins didn't lose the Buffalo game. You know, there, no, there was – you know, there was lack of, you know – aggressive play calling there's lack of tackling on the defense you know there's you know a lot of it came down though to third down conversions and some of the things that he messed up were in the protection game and you know that's where you know this bye week and going in and playing a Jets you know a Jets team that's not Buffalo hopefully you'll see drastic improvement and I would like to say you know let's let's go back and say the greatest improvements that you see from a team or from week one to week two well you could also say that for a quarterback you know this will be his second second full start under his belt that he knows he's getting well let's see how much of improvement that 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 can happen and you know I think Kevin O'Connell is still feeling him out as a play caller um I, I don't know why there's not more you know at this point, what do you have to lose? I mean, there's so many, there's so many wrinkles and things that you, that Kevin O'Connell has up his sleeve that I'd like to see, but you know, that's, I, that's not my, that's not my bag. But right. at this point to me, it's like, 
what you got is what you got and, and play to their strengths. So that, to say all that is, like I said, you know, he's growing and, you know, I don't, I don't think we should all hold him to a certain standard based off of his immaturity early on because, right. you know, you're not looking at the fourth round wide receiver the same way as you are Dwayne Haskins and rightfully so. But I think also Dwayne picked up on that and fixed it. Yeah, and you know it's funny you talk about and first like with with O'Connell, I think there's some um, there's a, certainly a directive from Bill Callahan to to play a certain way and and you know the the, the desire to run the ball quite a bit. Um, yeah. I think there was some and as some fans have pointed out to me on Twitter and I would agree there are some times in the second half maybe you could have gone some play action because the safeties were crashing down so hard on the run. Um, but um, yeah. I think there's a directive to be conservative well, with him and then to, and to build his game, to be honest, I think. Yes. And I, I thought the same way. Um, I, I had said that about taking some shots, but the, the shots they need to take are calculated that protect the Wayne and, and protect the football. And, you know, there was one, they were in the red zone after a couple of the long AP runs and they, Dwayne got sacked and, and basically in order for him not to have gotten sacked, he would have had to check out of a play action and sent the back to the edge. And, right. you know, that's some next level things right there. And, and, the, and he just not going to have the freedom to do that. So right. I understand it as a play, even as a high school play caller, you, you get handcuffed by, you know, the situations and the players that you have and experience and all that. I'm not comparing them one, one way or right. the other. It's just, it's just similar because, you have to go with what you have and, and you you're so confident going into a game plan that you've worked on this, you've repped this, you don't want to put too much on a kid's plate. Um, and what I did like about the game plan was you saw Dwayne Haskins, you know, kind of morph in and out of the game plan with right. what he had. So he, he moved around. He didn't, you know, he didn't take unnecessary shots. The ones that he did take, he was, you know, the third down, you know, the out route was right. awesome. Awesome. That was a we great talked throw. about that. Yeah, we talked about that on Twitter. That's knowing what's going to happen, knowing where to go with the ball, knowing I'm going to take a shot. That's NFL third downs in a nutshell. So um, he just has to stack more of those plays sure. by the end of the year to gain more confidence heading into next year. And I think it also will help attract another coach, too, the better he plays, to be honest. If he plays well – and if he shows some things and another coach who's out there is like, oh, okay, I can work with that. And I, I that's agree. An, that's an important part of this. And it's funny, that third down play, what I really liked about it too is, and one of the things that I know that they've had a, some problems with him in the earlier was the accuracy. He wasn't as accurate as they would like. And you saw that in the Minnesota game, the interception. Well, why did the interception? He doesn't step into the throw. And he was talked to about that before that game or after that game. So we flash ahead to right. this play on that out, you know, it wasn't a big, he didn't exactly step into it because there wasn't a lot of step into ability to do that, but you still could see enough of the weight transfer to me that you could get, make an accurate throw. And he had his feet in the right direction. He couldn't plant them as well, but they were at least pointed in the right direction and enough of a weight transfer that it resulted in a really good throw. And that arm time, then he kind of had to change the arm angle too. A lot of good, I think yeah. there was a lot of good things about that particular play. Yeah, and I think it's a lot of we call it like figure it outness, and and the more the more he has to figure it out, the better for him because things have been, you know, on the football field for him have been very easy. I mean, he's just been the most talented thrower on the field since he was eight years old. He's been, you know, the most charismatic guy. You know, endearing himself to others has not been difficult, but you know now, you know, I think the culmination of it is. Again, like off the field, in the in the locker room, in the meeting room, it, it will carry itself over onto the field. It's not like he's – it's not a reverse effect in that he's an underachiever physically, so he's put so much work in, and, and it's you still hope it works out. I compare – you know, I, I hate to say it, but that's kind of what Case Keenum is, right? Like right. he's a grinder, he's an underachiever, but physically you just realize – you know, everything has to be a certain way for him to be good. Whereas the flip side is for Dwayne, right? Like he can overcome some things on the field and 
the confidence that he has going onto the field is a direct result from Monday to Friday. So, you know, I, I hope that he continues to grow. I, I hope that he, you know, has a good balance of, you know, what he needs to do. Um, but it was encouraging and for me just watching it. You know, there was, there was nothing spectacular, but there was nothing detrimental, you know, and yeah. there's a, plenty of other franchises right now that would love to say that about their quarterback because some, you know, are a disaster. And, it's, and I don't think the Redskins are there at the quarterback position where it's a dumpster fire. So it's a, surprising to say, but that's a, 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 solid, a solid position for them right now. And it's funny because the narrative has been, you know, and this is a guy who's still, listen, I know there's some people who would say there that he should have been a second round pick or, you know, they would have had a different grades on him. I think that a lot of teams had different grades on him, probably within their own building would have different grades on him. But you're still talking about a guy who was a higher pick because the talent is there. The other, the last thing I want to ask Paul too is along with that is because of his age um, and he's not like, as you know, he's not like the most, um, you know, he's not a shy, shy guy, but he's also doesn't walk mm. into the room and just command it right away. Um, right. Can he grow into that? And is that just a part of the process where the more comfortable and confident you get, the more you become, you know, like, like for example, Russell Wilson went to Seattle and right away was telling guys what to do. But Russell Wilson was a right. five-year player in college. So, you know, is that something that he can grow into with him? Well, I think, you know, you have the Russell Wilson aspect also as he played professional baseball. So Absolutely. Um, Much different, you know, but there's a, different – two ends of the extreme there. Or not two yeah, ends. Yeah, and I think – A different extreme. You know, and I, I, I would be remiss if I didn't point out, you know, everybody should understand Dwayne's growth. Um, you know, he lived in New Jersey, then he moved down here to go to Bullis, and he, you know, he pretty much um, – was the talk of the town and in, in the prep circuits of, you know, yeah, absolutely. When he, and could go anywhere that he wanted. And so I think early on, he, he learned to be guarded uh, from that aspect. I think his dad, you know, is a good teacher for him with that. But at the same time, um, he's still learning like adult things, right? Absolutely. Like, uh, he's 22. <laughs> Right. I'm sure he's learning how to manage a, a, a checkbook. I'm sure he's learning how to manage, you know, whoever he has in his circle. Um, and I think he's keeping his circle small. And I, I would just, you know, I hope that eventually he's able to be a, a thermostat leader and not a thermometer leader, you know, where he's not affected by everybody else in the room. He kind of affects others in the room like you kind of observe um time will tell but i think that that only comes from real confidence right like i'm, I'm sure he walks into the meeting room a little bit different this week than he does yeah. after the minnesota game so i say all that you know the only thing that can can increase that would be self-confidence genuine self-confidence not false bravado um right. And and the only way to get that is to to be successful on the field, and that comes through preparation. So, if for nothing else that that has happened to him, if he was humbled enough by lack of preparation, and wise enough to recognize that at his age, then that's he's ahead of the game. He's more he's ahead of the game like more than the Michael Vicks or the Mitch right. Trubisky's or any any guy that you could say has a ton of talent but just never, you know, never reached his full potential uh, based off of things that, you know, preparation was lacking. You know, I mean, those guys that I mentioned, I mean, Michael Vick and his, I watched the football life and he was very adamant. He didn't prepare one bit, you know, and yeah. the league will make, they will humble you, humble you quick because it doesn't matter how talented you are. So I don't and know. That's, that's a long answer. No, I, that, that, it's a long answer. I just think confidence, confidence will bring, will breed more confidence, but it's not, it has to be real. It has to be earned. It can't be fake bravado. And, and I, I agree with that. And that's why I say this is going to be a good experience over the next seven games because of how are you going to build on this and how, you know, are you, you know, to me, it's always been about laying the foundation for his game. And I've always believed that you have to be at a certain point before you can go in and learn. 
And I do think some of the lessons he can learn are about all of that. But that's going to, if he lets it, should build a strong foundation for the rest of, because as people there have told me, it's like, it's not about starting this year. It's always been about, can you um, be a 10-year right. starter? They want you to be a 10-year starter. Well, and then I, and I, I, I will shed light on this. Like, in my opinion, kudos to him for, for whoever's in his camp not letting things get out for the first seven weeks. You know, I mean, there's something to be said about keeping your mouth shut and being a good teammate and not being, you know, a right. lightning rod for controversy in, in an already controversial environment. So, yeah. you know, the fact that we didn't hear a lot about Dwayne Haskins, you know, through, you know, secondary sources or this and that, I mean, that says a lot about him because I know nowadays that's, that's hard enough keeping your own opinions to yourself and you don't tell anybody. I mean, that's Absolutely. especially, especially as a quarterback. So he's obviously doing, he's obviously wise enough and, and, and knows the ways of the, the building and, and who's in his inner circle enough to, you know, not, cause I can, I know for a fact he wasn't happy. I know right. for a fact he wasn't, you know, pleased with the situation, but I don't think the national narrative was Dwayne Haskins is upset. I think it was just like, well, he's just not ready and this, this, and this. So right. kudos to him for that as well. Absolutely. Hey, Paul, listen, I love your insight. Thank you very much for joining you. And I enjoyed this as always. Thank you. Uh, thanks, John. Go Buckeyes, right? <laughs> there you go. Yeah. As long as Chase <laughs> Young gets back now. After this break, I'll be back with Mike Jones from USA Today to discuss Trent Williams, his take on more of what Williams told Mike in an interview and what his value might be this offseason on the trade market. Welcome back. Before I play my conversation with Mike Jones from USA Today, I wanted to share a couple of highlights from a talk that I had with Trent Williams shortly after I taped my interview with Mike. Williams remains adamant in his version of events, and like he told Mike, he does not want to help out the Redskins by agreeing to a third-party review. He feels that it would be basically just doing something to help them cover their butts, as he said. He said all he really wanted for them to tell him was that they messed up and it's time to go their separate ways. At some point, he really just wanted apology from them, and that may have changed his desire to remain. I don't know, but that's what he has said, and he also told Dan Graziano, that my colleague at ESPN. Now, I will also tell you that I spoke with multiple people from the Redskins about this, and they're very frustrated because they can't say anything in response. It's Williams' word versus their silence because of HIPAA laws. Now, I know from Williams' perspective, part of why he's talking out is because he feels that there's been a little bit of an effort from the Redskins through um, varying uh, various media outlets to maybe paint it a certain way, but they can't say anything publicly. So, and that I know that is frustrating for them. That's why they wanted the third party review because they wanted it all out there. Anyway, their frustration too stems from not truly knowing who is Williams upset with it as far as the medical staff. Medical staff is a pretty broad term here. And I do believe that trainer Larry Hess is one of the people that Williams is not happy with, but his job isn't to diagnose the growth on someone's head. So there's other medical personnel involved. The people with the Redskins have told me that Williams didn't even want to name them to, to them. And Williams said he doesn't want to cost anyone their job. Messy situation anyways. I wanted to add all that before getting on to my conversation with Mike Jones. So now, let's turn to that conversation. All right, now I'm bringing in Mike Jones, my my guy, used to cover the Redskins for the Washington Post, now works for USA Today, covering national stuff. Wrote a really good story on Trent Williams, talked to him uh, for a story that ran on Friday, do yourself a favor. I'm sure you've seen it. If you haven't, go check it out, because there's a lot more stuff from Trent in there about the situation. And Mike, there's a lot to unpack with this. And some of the stuff, like we knew that he was, we knew he was upset. We knew the trust had been broken. What did you take away from your interview with him? Um, I, I really could feel how genuine Trent was in this. You know, people, you know, we had heard 
I, I mean, people for a while, I, you know, it was all about the money. You know, you knew there was something about the, the medical stuff, but you didn't know how much, you didn't know if that was a money grab or whatever, but Trent is legit, legitimately genuine in his frustration with the team, his disappointment with how it played out. Um, you know, we talked about how he, he said he, he wanted to be a Redskin for life. Um, and you also feel like, man, there was a lot of missteps. I think there were some missteps on Trent's part or the part of his agent um, with the way he was advising Trent. Um, I think there was missteps on the part of the Redskins for sure. Um, and I feel like, man, it's, it's too bad. They just couldn't have a do over here. Um, but Trent very much feels like at one point he felt like this could have been resolved, but the Redskins never, um, demonstrated that they understood the severity. They were very dismissive, he said, um, and that they still just saw this as a money grab type of thing. And that really was what led to the deterioration of their relationship. One of the things that's funny, because one of the things when I talk to people over there, and this, is ha this has been going, I would say I've heard this for many months now, is who exactly, what doctor is he mad at? You know, because like nobody's been named. I think no one's been named because it could open them, can open up a lawsuit possibility. But do you, you know, like who is, which doctor, which medical stuff is he more upset with? Well, that's what I asked him. I said, okay, so who was it? You know, that, was it your team doctor or was it actually a partner from Inova or what? I, that's why I wanted to find out. And he said, look, man, like, I don't really want to name doctors. Um, you know, these people have families. These guys have been good to me for a lot of years. Um, you know, I'm very frustrated that they didn't um, catch this right here and that they continue to tell me it wasn't something big. But what I took from it was what more than anything was that after it happened, it was the, the Redskins response and then the media leaks and things like that that made him more hurt and angry um, and, and done with this team more than anything. And that, yeah, and that, and with Bruce Allen too, because that seems to be where he is, you know, and obviously when we asked him about Bruce Allen last week, his thing, his response was next question. So, and, and he right. was a little bit more expansive on that, but is it more with, with Allen, is it more about the, what he perceives as leaks coming from him or was there something else? Well, um, he, he said that he had um, a – originally his frustration was all contract-related. He said exit interviews. He had a two-hour conversation with Bruce about his contract. He said, I wanted to start the conversation of how we, I could become a Redskin for life. I know that when a team really wants somebody, they find a way to keep them. If they don't want them, they trade them away to get some assets. And so I said, look, I understand we're in a rebuild. If you don't want to dump more money into the offensive line, um, you know, send me somewhere that does want me. Um, and Bruce kind of like brushed that off in Trent's opinion. And then after they did find out about the cancer and whatever, um, and they, ex he expressed his frustration, um, that the doctors had continued to tell him it was nothing. And it was, he said, Bruce was very dismissive of that as well. And then he said, when stuff started coming out in the media, he said, there was stuff that came out that only two or three people knew. And I knew it wasn't coming from my team, um, my camp, him and his agent. Um, he said, and, and then they've tried to classify this. He said, they're putting poison pills out there. That it was all about the money, the missed appointments, things like that. He said, that's when he knew, or in his opinion, that the Redskins were out to try to uh, paint him in a negative light. And that's why he doesn't want to go along with that investigation, because he felt like regardless of what they find, they're going to go ahead and, and try to put some type of negativity on it. The, the flip side of that, though, is – he's the only one who gets a say in this medical stuff right now. The Redskins can't say anything. So right. we're now having to take his word. At, and I, you know, Trent, we've both dealt with Trent for a number of years and Trent's always been a pretty straight shooter with everybody, but you are left with only getting one side in this. And I think my understanding is that that's why they wanted these, an independent doctor and the NFLPA to go along with this. So they could at least say lay it out there. And I think that's where some of the hard part is here. Right, exactly. Um, and and I, look, I, I I reached out to Bruce Allen, gave him a list of my questions, did not expect a reply um, because, yes, there's medical stuff involved. Um, I think it was Sherry Burris from NBC who had a sit down with him and, and Bruce, you know, didn't go into medical details or anything like that and just maintained, look, if Trent wants to play, 
in 2019 or be in our uniform. Right. Said it again right. publicly when they fired Jay. I think he did as well. We're not going to get answers from them because they can't. Um, I friend, if it wasn't public, that's why he stayed quiet for so long. He said that he was hoping they could resolve this privately. And, you know, if they had said, look, we messed up. How can we make this right? What can we do? Um, I think this thing could have played out differently. But again, there was the assumption on their part. He was, wasn't as scared as he was by this and that he really, the, that's not the case. Obviously everybody's got different perceptions. You know, the one version, the other version, and the truth. And we don't know what that the actual middle ground is. That's all for today. Thank you to Paul Troth for joining me. Remember, you can catch him on NBC Sports Washington, where he does some analysis work for them. And also, thank you to Mike Jones. You can read him on USA Today or in USA Today. And you can also listen to the Football Jones Report podcast. I would suggest doing so. Again, as we talked in the po- earlier, has some really good guests on there. But mostly... Thank you for listening. Hang in there. Hey, come check out a live taping of the John Kime Report. It's going to take place on Monday, November 18th at City Tap in Loudoun 1 out in Ashburn, Virginia. Start time around 8 o'clock. It'll end at 9 p.m. In the show notes, you can find the Eventbrite invitation that you can RSVP to to ensure that you get seats. It's free to show up. And if you can't find the invitation in the show notes, shoot me an email and I'll send you a link directly to you for you to sign up. You can find me at Bram, B-R-A-M, at AmpireMedia.com, A-M, P-I-R-E media.com. Bram at empiremedia.com. And we look forward to seeing you on the 18th at CityTap Loudon.